nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You are living home. Your presence, Lord. How tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves When my heart becomes free And my shame is undone Your presence, Lord
you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot see cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you I will not leave you as orphans I will come to you the helper the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you peace I live with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you let not your hearts be troubled neither let it be afraid Me and I 
Hi again, City Church. We're connected once again in this unusual new normal online, just like all churches around the world. And it's so good to know that you, we can still be with each other in this manner. I want to appreciate you for, for being online with us. Last week, we had over a thousand of you commenting, a thousand comments uh, that came in, uh, lots of people viewing. And we want to encourage you to keep the comments coming as much as possible. We try to reply. There's people that really are anxious to, to want to meet with you and connect with you through the comments. If you're like me, as many of our church members are also feeling, we miss being together in the big room, having great worship together and, and, and the word and ministry with each other, with real people. But keep praying one day. We'll get there soon. And so in the meantime, this is the best that we can do. And I pray if you would join us, I'd love it that you are always with us exactly when church starts. That's 10 a.m. and of course 428 in the afternoon as well. Try to make it a habit uh, so that we can all be worshiping and listening at the same time. It's beautiful to just know that in one place or one city, uh, hundreds of us are, are connected somehow in the spirit and online and we're worshiping like this rather than trying to watch us during the week and, and connecting to us uh, on a recording. We'd love to have you with us at exactly 10 o'clock. It's good to just come in a little bit early, get in touch with each other, and then we can all pray and we can worship together as well, okay? Uh, we've been receiving a lot of comments and questions as well, and we'd like to address those questions. Many of you have been asking, is the pandemic the judgment of God? Um, is this the beginning of the end times? Uh, other questions that would come in is like, why did God allow COVID-19, etc.? And so there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, and I am sure that God doesn't want us to be anxious, and He doesn't want us to be left hanging as to what's really going on. And so what I did was contacted a good friend of the church. If you remember, Pastor Roy Versosa. Um, he is a Cebuano. He had a church here uh, years ago, migrated to the States, and then uh, studied at a, at a very prestigious Bible Institute in Canada. And from there, received his doctorate. He's a doctor of Div divinity. And I threw to him the same questions that were asked. Where is the pandemic? in the prophetic timeline of God. Uh, is this the beginning of the end? Is this, you know, God's judgment? The same questions that were coming in. Uh, why did God allow it? I threw it to him. I said, could you, with your expertise in the word on end times, could you actually help us by uh, sending a message to City Church and answering these questions? And uh, he bit on it right away, and he said he'd love to do that. He was supposed to be here with us um, next month to do a seminar. He said, I'll just record it from Canada, and then I'll, I'll, I'll send it over to you. And I said, we'll show it today. And so today, a uh, very special guest all the way from Canada is connecting to us. Um, his name is Dr. Roy Versosa, our very own Cebuano minister uh, who goes all over the world ministering. He's our guest speaker today, and I'd love you to have your hearts open. Get some notes ready. It's a very wordy message. You will learn a lot. Basically, in from where we are till the end times, where does this pandemic fall in the timeline or in the prophetic schedule of God uh, from now till the end of days? And so Dr. Roy Versosa is going to address that. And if you would, uh, start from the very beginning, try not to skip a bit because it's, it's very sequential what he teaches and I'm sure you, you'd love to share it. Uh, hit the share button, tell your friends about it and review the message again. I, I, it's a fantastic word that comes from a man who has uh, a passion to talk about end times. But before we do that, let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word is life and spirit. Thank you that even though we're not connected physically, um, online we are, spiritually we are, and our brother who's ministering from the other side of the world is ministering to us as well, 
and yet we have the same spirit. Bless this word to every listener. I pray the listeners uh, will put away every distraction, everything that will take their attention off the word of God. I pray your anointing touches them wherever they are and bless your people that listen. Also, Lord Jesus, bless every household, bless every family that throughout what this world is going through, let your children and their household be safe. Let them be healthy. Let them be confident that you are our God and you watch over us. Bless this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Welcome, please, Dr. Roy Versosa. Hi, City Church. Mayung buntag sa inyong tanan. Also to all the brothers and sisters from the other churches who will be watching this broadcast, good morning everyone. It's good evening here in Toronto. So from our living room to yours, welcome everyone. I hope and pray that you're all doing good, safe and secure in your respective homes. Same with my family here, by God's grace we are doing good. Salamat kay Pastor Joe for inviting me to do this broadcast. I know we're supposed to be doing a seminar there in Cebu next month. But this pandemic rearranged all our schedules. But I praise God for the privilege that we can still meet online and study God's Word together, even in the midst of this crisis. I know that because of this plague, this coronavirus, there is a growing interest in the minds of people today with regards to biblical prophecy. People are asking, where are we in God's prophetic plan? Is this pandemic the one predicted in the book of Revelation chapter 6, 7 and 8, which says, When the Lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague. Now, remember the book of Revelation is talking about three waves of judgments. First, you have the seven seals, followed by the seven trumpets, and then the seven bowl judgment. And this plague that Revelation talks about is just the fourth seal that will kill one-fourth of mankind. So is this coronavirus, this plague? Well, friends, we thank God that He did not leave us in the dark when it comes to the sequence of the events that will befall earth before the grand and glorious day of his return. In fact, Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, 7 and 8, he said here, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. So Jesus is telling us that when we hear of calamities like this pandemic, don't be alarmed. These are just the beginning of birth pains. Brothers and sisters, this pandemic is just a dress rehearsal for the bigger plague that will kill one-fourth of the world's population. But what is so interesting in what Jesus Christ said is that he identified for us what we really need to watch out. Just a few verses later in Matthew 24, verse 15, he said, So when you see standing in the holy place, referring to the temple in Jerusalem, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of, through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Friends, what is this that Jesus emphasizes? Let the reader understand spoken of through the prophet Daniel. Friends, there is no doubt that Jesus was referring to Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, which is known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. You know, this is considered to be the greatest and most important prophecy in all of the Bible because here, God gave us a timeline, a calendar of events, so to speak, that can help us understand as to where we are in God's prophetic plan. Now, before we study this passage, let me give you the background to what's happening here in Daniel chapter 9. By the way, just like what I say in all my seminars, I'm not an original thinker, I'm just a dealer of secondhand thoughts. So what you will see here is a conglomeration of ideas from different sources. Okay, so Daniel was in, in Babylon, exiled there together with the, with the Jewish remnant. He was doing his devotions one day, reading from the book of Jeremiah, where he read that their exile will last for 70 years. Now, realizing that the 70 years was almost up, 
He went into intense time of prayer and fasting, confessing his personal sins as well as their national sins, and then pleading God for mercy. Then, about three o'clock that afternoon, the angel Gabriel interrupted his prayer to reveal to him what will happen after their 70 years of exile. And so friends, Daniel chapter 9 to 20 to 27 is the angel Gabriel speaking to Daniel. This is considered to be the backbone of all prophecy, the template used to understand where we are in God's prophetic plan. So verse 24, the angel Gabriel said, 70 sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city. So the context of this prophecy is with regards to the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, and its capital city, Jerusalem. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So here in verse 24, the angel Gabriel identified for us seven purposes for this prophecy. The first three is with regards to redemption, and then the last three is with regards to restoration. All right, so that's verse 24 telling us the purposes, at least six that we can see here. And now in verse 25, the angel Gabriel continued, Know and understand this, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death. And will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Last verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Now, to understand these seven sevens, we need to understand the heptadic calendar that the Jews are using. Seven, of course, hepta means seven. They go through the cycle of seven. If you count seven days, the seventh day is called the Shabbat. Now, if you count seven weeks, that's called the Shabbat. Now, seven weeks, that means seven times seven is 49 days. If you add one more day, the 50th day, that's what they call their Pentecost. All right? And then if you count seven months, you know, they have their civil calendar. On the seventh month, that's the start of the religious year, the religious calendar. That's the start of the feasts in Israel. And so the seventh month is Nisan, and the first feast is Passover. Nisan is about March and April in our calendar. Now, if you count seven years, now this is very important. This is called the sabbatical year. Now, on the sabbatical year, on the seventh year, they release the slaves, they cancel all debts, but then they allow the land to rest for that seventh year. That means they till the land, they harvest from the land on the first six years, but on the seventh year, they need to allow the land to rest. And then if you count seven sabbatical years, and if you add seven times seven, that's 49 years. If you add one more year, the, the, the 50th year, that's what they call the jubilee year. And so that's the Jewish heptadic calendar. But what is so important here, friends, is the sabbatical year. You see, the Jews, the Jewish nation, they violated the sabbatical year. They did not allow the land to rest on the seventh year. In fact, they violated this for 490 years. So for 490 years, the land, they kept on tilling the land, harvesting from the land. They did not allow their land to rest every seventh year. So that means 490 years divided by seven, they owe the land 70 years of rest. And that's why Second Chronicles 36 verse 21 says, The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests all the time of its desolation. It rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by, by Jeremiah, found in Jeremiah 25 and 29. So that means their 70 years of exile in Babylon was a payment for their failure to allow the land to rest for 70 years. Bayad utang, 70 years. So 
Here in verse 25, let's focus here. It's seven sevens and 62 sevens. That means 69 sevens all in all. So here's what the prophet Daniel or prophet Gabriel, no, the angel Gabriel said. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. We can see there the two conjunctions. It gives us a time frame from and until. So from the time the word goes out to restore Jerusalem up to the time the Messiah presents himself as the king, that's the from and until. And it says there that it will take seven sevens and 62 sevens. That means 69 sevens all in all. 69 sabbatical years on all in all. Now remember the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. In the lunar calendar, they only have 360 days in a year. Ours is solar calendar. We have 365 days in one year. So 69 seven, 69 times seven times 360 days in one year. That is 173,880 days. So what the angel Gabriel is telling the prophet Daniel is that from the time the commandment to restore Jerusalem is given, you just have to count 173,880 days or 69 sabbatical years. And then the person who presents himself as the Messiah is the true Messiah. And then it says there, from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, we are indebted to a man who made these calculations going back in time to calculate when was this restoration or rebuilding of Jerusalem. We are indebted to Sir Robert Anderson. He was the head of the Scotland Yard. You know, he came up with this monumental book in 1894 entitled The Coming Prince. You know, with his analytical mind, he was able to go back in time and calculate when was this command to restore Jerusalem. There are several decrees to rebuild Jerusalem. There was one given by Cyrus found in Ezra 1. There is one given by Darius in Ezra chapter 6. Artaxerxes gave a decree in Ezra 7. And then second decree by Artaxerxes given in Nehemiah chapter 2. This is when he sent Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Now friends, the command is very specific. It is to be rebuilt with streets and a trench, meaning the walls of Jerusalem. And so the command is to is for the city, not the temple, to be rebuilt. Now, the decree of Cyrus has to do with the temple. The decree of Darius has to do with the temple. And then the first decree by Artaxerxes also has to do with the temple. But the second decree by Artaxerxes, when he sent Nehemiah, has to do with the city itself, rebuilding the streets and a wall around Jerusalem. And Sir Robert Anderson recalculated this. It falls on March 14. 445 BC. Now, this is before Christ. That means he's using there a solar calendar, 365 days. And then it says there that from and then until when the Messiah presents himself. So this one is March 14, 445 BC. Now, when did the Messiah or the Lord Jesus Christ presented himself? This is what we call the triumphal entry. Now, we find a... Uh, uh, a date or calculation of the date from Luke chapter 3. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, that means we are on the running 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, this is John the Baptist, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. When he began his ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age. So that means he started the ministry on the 15th year, the running 15th of Tiberius Caesar. Now friends, here's the chronology of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. The ministry of Jesus started within the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now we know that Augustus Caesar died on August 19, 14 AD. Immediately after the death of Augustus Caesar, he was replaced by Tiberius Caesar. That means the first year of Tiberius Caesar is on the 14th, uh, 14 AD. Now remember, it's already the running 15. That means 14 years had already passed since uh, Tiberius Caesar started to reign. So that means 14 AD plus 14 years, we are now on the 28 AD. So 28 AD is the running 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Jesus' ministry started in the fall of 28 AD. Now when was this triumphal entry? We put together the Gospels. It informs us that the triumphal entry occurred on the 4th and last Passover attended 
by the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Sir Robert Anderson calculated this to happen on April 6, 32 AD. So we have the two main events here. We have the uh, commandment to restore Jerusalem, March 14, 445 BC, and then the triumphal entry, April 6, 32 AD. Again, as I've said, this is a solar calendar. So if we deduct 445 BC and 32 AD, that will give us 173,740 days. If we deduct March 14 and April 6, that gives us 24 days. And then in the solar calendar, we have leap years, and this will give us 116 days. So we add 173,740 days plus 24 plus 116 equals 173,880 days. Exactly as the angel Gabriel predicted, the person who will present himself as the Messiah is the true Messiah. You just have to wait 173,880 days. You know what was happening when Jesus Christ was riding that donkey coming from Mount of Olives? We read from Luke chapter 19 these words. By the way, this is what you'll see from the Mount of Olives. You'll see the uh, Temple Mount right there. Right now, you have there the, uh, the Dome of the Rock, you know, that uh, gold-covered uh, dome right there. But during the time of Jesus, that's where you have the Temple, all right? So from Mount of Olives, he was riding this donkey. He's coming down and overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And here's what it says. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city. He wept over it. The Lord Jesus Christ was weeping, riding that donkey coming down. Now what is interesting, we don't see this in the English translation, but there are two words for weep. One is to weep silently and the other is to weep loudly. When Jesus Christ was at the funeral service of Lazarus, Jesus wept. The shortest verse, Jesus wept. The word weep there is to weep silently. That means a tear just dropped and flowed from his cheek. But here, when he was riding that donkey coming down from Mount of Olives, he wept loudly. He was wailing. You could almost hear him wail as he was riding that donkey coming down from Mount of Olives. And it says there, if you, even you, and he's talking about the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, if you, even you, I mean, you have the prophets, you have the scriptures, you have the prophecies, you could have studied this, you should have known this day, if you, even you, it says there, had only known on this day, and this very day, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you read the Gospels, He's very conscious of His time. He always says, it's not yet my time. It's not yet my time. And you know, He was waiting for this exact day. He was waiting for 173,880 days. On that particular day, when He would present Himself as the Messiah. But friends, they missed it. What would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes as a punishment. Their eyes were blinded, their hearts were hardened because of this. And so friends, on April 6, 32 AD, their hearts were hardened, their eyes were blinded. Now they won't see the glory of their Messiah who came to them on that very day. Now what is interesting is that April 6, 32 AD, according to the computation of Sir Robert Anderson, is... Uh, the tent of Nisan. Now, this is very important. On the tent of Nisan, Jesus Christ presented himself. And then four days later, you know, when Jesus Christ was coming down, entering the uh, the temple area, people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna means save us, save us. But then four days later, on the 14th of Nisan, they were no longer shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Now, those two dates are very important, the tent of Nisan and the 14th. Of Nisan. So here's what happened in verse 26. Now it says there, after the 62 sevens, remember there were seven sevens and 62 sevens, so that's after the 69 sevens, the anointed one, that's the Messiah, will be put to death. Karat, will be cut off, will be executed. You know, this is what is mind-boggling in the minds of the Jews because they cannot understand how the Messiah should die. But here, the prophecy says, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death. Now, what is interesting is that Jesus Christ arrived in Jerusalem, coming down from Mount of Olives, April 6, 32 AD. 
now on the tenth of Nisan. Very interesting is that on the tenth of Nisan, that's also the time they would choose the lamb that they're going to present for the Passover sacrifice. So on the tenth of Nisan, the lamb is presented, a year old lamb without blemish is presented to the high priest. And then they're going to wait for four days to inspect that lamb to make sure that it is qualified. Once after four days it is qualified, the high priest would declare, Behold the lamb, I find no fault in him. And therefore, on the 14th of Nisan, that's the time when they offer and sacrifice this lamb three o'clock that afternoon. And Jesus Christ, on that day when he, pre he presented himself as the, as the Messiah, uh, April 6, 32 AD, that's the 10th of Nisan. Four days later, they were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And so friends, fulfilling at three o'clock that afternoon, Jesus himself died and offered himself. And so here, we have the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in 32 AD. And then it says there, the people of the ruler, ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, this refers to the people, the ruler, the, the Romans came, led by General Titus, and they destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And so the sanctuary itself was destroyed in 70 AD. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ, while he was riding that donkey, he, he reiterated this prophecy spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Jesus Christ said there in Luke 19, when your enemies will build an embankment, and that's what the Romans did. They lay seeds on the city of Jerusalem. When they finally overwhelmed the, the, the walls of Jerusalem, they burned the city, burned the temple on 70 AD. And General Titus commemorated this. If you go to Rome today, you'll see there the arts of Titus commemorating the seeds of Jerusalem. And on, on one side of the wall, you'll see there the articles taken from the temple right there is the menorah. And then there you have the captured rebels. So this is historical uh, data. Uh, this event is supported by the historical data that we have here. And so Jesus Christ said, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You know, that's a very important statement from Luke 19. That means Jesus Christ is putting squarely the responsibility for the Jews to know their Bibles. They should know their scriptures. They should know their prophecy because you miss this day. Then, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you, therefore you will have this judgment. The city will be destroyed. And in fact, it did. It got destroyed in 70 AD. And so right there, 70 AD, it was destroyed. And so friends, verse 26 is like a parenthesis. 70 AD is right there. So it's been 2,000 years now. It's almost like this gap. Between verse 25 and verse 27, there's this gap of 2,000 plus years. We know that, that there's this gap because in verse 27, it talks about the temple and the temple is not yet there. There's no temple yet in Jerusalem up to today. They are preparing for it, but up to today, there's no temple. So we know that there's this gap in verse 26. This is the ongoing uh, activity that we now have. If we focus now on verse 27, here's what the angel Gabriel said. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. This is the 70th week. This is the last sabbatical year, the last seven years. And this is where the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel would merge. And so the book of Revelation talks about the seven years of tribulation, the last seven years. And there we identify, and he, the Daniel 9.27, the he that refers to the Antichrist shall confirm the covenant with many, referring to Israel, for one week or seven years. Friends, the tribulation starts when they sign, the Antichrist signs a treaty with Israel, the peace treaty that will supposed to last for seven years. And so friends, that's the covenant is confirmed, the peace treaty is enforced, and that should be for seven years. Now, the covenant is confirmed. Because right now we have about three or four peace treaties already signed by Israel. He signed it with uh, Egypt. He signed it with Jordan. He signed it with Palestine. And so three or four of these peace treaties. But none of them are working right now. But finally it will be confirmed and then treaty will be enforced. Peace treaty. Now, whatever this 
treaty that will happen here, it will include the building of the temple. That will be one of the stipulations in this treaty. And that's why Israel will be so glad to sign this because they really want their temple to be back. But here's what the angel Gabriel said. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. That means he will violate this treaty in the middle. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. Remember, this is what the Lord Jesus Christ referred to in Matthew chapter 24. An abomination that causes desolation. This is what you need to watch. When this happens, don't go back to your home. Pray that it won't be winter. Pray that you won't be pregnant. Because this is the great tribulation that will happen. The mark of the 666 will happen after this. This abomination that causes desolation. And so that temple should be there. And right now, we don't have the temple yet. That's why we know that verse 27 is still in the future. And so friends, right here, three and a half years, in the middle of those three and a half, uh, seven years, the three and a half years, you have there the abomination of desolation. So we don't have the temple yet. So we know verse 27 is the, in the future. We know that verse 25 is already past. We know that verse 26 is the present. That's where we are right now. Verse 26, so we're asking the question, where are we in God's prophetic plan? 2020 should be somewhere right there. We do not know how much time we, we still have until they, they ratify this uh, covenant and then start the, the peace treaty with the Antichrist. And so friends, where are we in God's prophetic plan? And so here, the key is in this eyes. Their eyes were blinded, their hearts are hardened. Until when is this blinding of their eyes and the hardening of their hearts? And, and the Apostle Paul identified for us, this will not be forever. There's a time frame. And here's what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 11, 25 to 26. He said, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Now, this mystery that he's referring to here is the remnant Jews who will finally recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Right now, the nation of Israel, they do not recognize Jesus the Messiah. There are Messianic Jews right now. There are a distinct minority in Israel right now, but a time is coming when they will finally recognize Jesus as their Messiah. That's a mystery that's not revealed in the Old Testament, but will be revealed in the New Testament. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. You know, these Roman Christians, these Gentile Christians, some of them were beginning to think, ah, God already rejected the Jews. We are now the chosen people of God. And God rejected the Jewish nation. Paul was warning them here in Romans chapter 9, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. Don't be conceited. God just grafted you in. The Gentiles were just grafted in. He can remove you. And so here, don't be conceited. God He's telling us here that the, the Gentiles did not replace the Jews as a God's people. Israel has experienced a hardening in part. It's only in part until, and that's the conjunction that's so important here. When is this hardening, these blinders, when will they be removed? The, their hearts will be softened and then turn to the Lord Jesus Christ until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Friends, the full number of Gentiles come. When the exact number, God knows the number. We do not know the number, but God knows the number. When the last Gentile comes in, when the last Gentile conversion, the last Gentile who receives the Lord Jesus Christ, when the church is complete, then friends, that's when God will start to move back and rescue the remnant of the Jewish nation to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. We don't know that number. But you know, it's very interesting. In the book of Acts, God is very concerned of this number. Those who accepted his message, this is the message of Peter, were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. 120 charter members, 3,000 were baptized. So now, the number there is 3,120. We're just in Acts chapter 2, verse 41 at Pentecost. The, uh, the start of the church. And then it says there in chapter 2, verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God is very concerned of that number. He's taking a, a tally of this number. And then chapter 4, verse 4, but many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000, just counting the men only. If you count the women and the children, that's, that's very easily 10,000 already. We're just in chapter 4, but the number, God is so concerned with that. And then here in chapter 5, verse 14, Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord 
and were added to their number. Friends, every time you share the gospel, you're adding to that number. And once that number is complete, then friends, something will happen. Here, as uh, reiterated here again, Romans chapter 11, verse 25, until the full number of the Gentiles come in. When the church is complete, when the last Gentile comes in, then friends, something will happen to the church. And the Apostle Paul said, the dead in Christ, those who are Christians who already died, will rise first. They will be resurrected. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. Now, that's the Greek word harpazo, and that's where we got the word rapture. It will be the, the catching away, the, the rapture of the church. And so, friends, once the number is complete, that's the time when the church will be raptured. When the church is taken out of the way, then, friends, God will go back to Israel to restore them, to, to save them, and recognize Jesus Christ. So, again... Uh, 2020 somewhere there we do not know how much time we have but the more we share the gospel we are hastening the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and then Jesus Christ said therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your your Lord will come and that's why every time you share the gospel Satan is panicky because this could be the last gentile and that's why Satan would discourage us from sharing the gospel especially during this time of this uh, pandemic. This is the best time to share the gospel when people are so aware of their mortality, when they're thinking about death. This is the time for them to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here, the after that will be the seven years of tribulation. And so there are Christians today who believe that the church will be spared from this tribulation. They take it from 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us, us, the believers, the church, to suffer wrath. And this is about the God's, God's wrath. And so there are those who believe that the rapture of the church, once the full number is complete, based on, uh, again, Revelation chapter 4, come up here. And that's the pre-trib position. Now, there are others who believe that the wrath of God is, uh, you know, in Revelation chapter 6, you have there the first wave of uh, judgments, and that's the uh, sealed judgments. After the sealed judgments, before the uh, trumpets, chapter 8 of Revelation, that's one position, that's the pre-wrath one, all right? Pre-wrath one. So they believe that it's after the sealed judgments, that's not yet the wrath of God, they say. The actual wrath of God is the, is the trumpet judgments. That's why chapter 8, they said that church will be ruptured. And then there are Christians who also believe that the first three and a half years is not yet the judgment, but the last three and a half. And that is what is called the Great Tribulation. And so they believe in the mid-trib, mid-tribulation rapture. When the Antichrist, you know, uh, puts the mark of the 666, without which you cannot buy or sell. That's the Great Tribulation, the start, the last three and a half years. And then there are Christians who believe that the sealed judgments is not yet the wrath of God. The trumpet judgments is not yet the wrath of God, but only the bold judgments. That's the start of the wrath of God. Chapter six, uh, chapter 16 of Revelation, the bold judgment is the wrath of God. It says there, chapter 16, verse 1. And so that's pre-wrath too. So there are Christians who believe that. And then there are Christians who believe that the church will go through the seven years of tribulation. And so that's the post-trib position. So friends, here, which one do you, uh, do you adhere to? Do you subscribe to? Now, there are people, they practice fanatic dogmatism. You know, in fanatic dogmatism, you choose one position there and then you condemn all the others. If you're post trib you condemn all the others. They are heretics. We are the only ones who strive. This is fanatic uh, dogmatism. Friends, we don't have to divide the church over what we believe about the rapture. Because number one, Remember, our salvation is not dependent on what rapture position you believed in. Because our salvation is based alone on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's by grace through faith. That's our salvation. And so whatever position you have there, if you're a true, genuine believer, you will be saved. But then there are, with regards to sanctification, the position you take there can have an impact on your mindset with regards to sanctification. Because people who are pre-trib, because they believe it can happen anytime now, it could happen tonight, it could happen tomorrow, then you need to be prepared. And so you sanctify yourself, you purify yourself. 
to be worthy. But then, friends, if you believe in post trib oh, it's still far off. There's no temple yet. There's no signing yet. We don't have to think so much about our sanctification right now. Some Christians might have that kind of mindset because, you know, it's still far off. Also, it can impact your service for the Lord. Because, again, if you're pre-trib, you want to serve now. You want to evangelize now. Because, again, it could happen anytime. But if it's post-trib, you know, it's not yet there. The Antichrist is not yet here. You know, it's almost like we're waiting for the Antichrist and then that's when we'll be serious about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not yet here. There's no even temple yet in Jerusalem. And then, of course, your mindset about suffering. Because if you're post-trib, you're ready because your mind is set that you're going to suffer the seven years. But if you're pre-trib, your mind is not set to suffer because you believe that you'll be ruptured before the seven years. And that can have an impact as well. But then also, if you're post-trib, you, and there's no temple yet, there's no signing yet, you might think also, I don't have to suffer now. You know, I'll just enjoy my life now. I'll just enjoy my Christian life now. I don't have to suffer now because I'll suffer when, once they sign the treaty. Then uh, I'll suffer. But right now, I'll just enjoy. You can also have that kind of mindset because, again, it's post-trip. But friends, what I'd like to propose is not fanatic dogmatism but realistic determinism. Realistic determinism is you need to be realistic about what's happening around you. You take one position and keep on watching what's happening around you. In fact, here's the Lord Jesus Christ telling us how we are to interpret these signs. He said, he told them this parable, look at the fig tree. And all the trees, when they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and you know that summer is near. When you see, you know. You can see and then you know. Even so, when you see these things happening, he's talking about the different signs. When you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Luke chapter 21. So what he's saying here is you don't have to be dogmatic about one position. You need to see and then verify. So you need to verify what is happening around you and then compare it with what the Bible says. I mean, if you're pre-trib and you already see the Antichrist making a, you know, a, a signing a contract, seven-year peace treaty with Israel, then friends, and if you're still here, then maybe you have to abandon your pre-trib position. Maybe it's the pre-wrath one. Maybe you have to go through the seven seals. And so you need to be prepared for that. But if you already went through the seven seals and still you're still here on earth, the church is still here, then you need to abandon your pre rat That's why it's verified. Your position will be realistic and then determine which position what uh, the Bible actually says. Because when you see, you know. But if you're already mid trib and you know the Antichrist already went inside the temple and then the 666 is already there and you're still here, then probably it's not mid-trib. Maybe it's pre wrath too. Maybe you have to go through the seven seals. You have to go through the seven trumpets. And it's the seven bowls of judgment. It's the actual wrath of God. So you need to be ready there. But if you went through the seven bowl of bowls of judgment, then friends, definitely it's post-trib, which is the true uh, position now. And so friends, what we need to do is we need to verify. But don't be fanatic. You know, don't be dogmatic. Have a realistic determination of which position you need to have but also the the lord jesus christ said watch therefore and pray we need to watch and we need to pray and that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the son of man that means friends we need to fortify ourselves we need to strengthen ourselves in the faith and be counted worthy to escape all these things fortify yourself also the Apostle John said, But we know that when Christ appears, we shall, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves. That means, friends, while you're waiting, whatever position you have there, you need to purify yourselves. And also the Lord Jesus Christ said, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. Friends, that's our mission order. We need to occupy Till Jesus Christ comes back. Occupy is the same root word as occupation, meaning use your occupation to uh, win more subjects for the kingdom. This kingdom mindset that we need to have. And so friends, we need to verify, we need to fortify, we need to purify, and we need to occupy while we're waiting. And so that's realistic determinism. But friends, with 
the Apostle Paul telling us that this, uh, this blindness, this hardness of the hearts of the Jews will end until the full number of the Gentiles come in. That means, friends, we need to keep on sharing the word because when that full number of the Gentiles, when the church is complete, then friends, that's the rapture of the church. That's the pre-trib position. And after the church is taken out in this way, all Israel will be saved. That means now, from the 69th week, God will now move into the 70th week. God will now rescue the remnant Jews who will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. And so this is now, God will now initiate God's plan for Israel. So that's the 69th week right there. There's the 70th week right there of Daniel. And friends, those seven, that 70th week, those seven years, it will not be a, a easy years. It will be the hardest in the history of the world, those seven years. In fact, Jeremiah said, how awful that day will be. That day is the seven years right there. How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for whom? For Jacob. This will be a time of trouble. Those seven years will be a time of trouble for Israel, but he will be saved out of it. This is the remnant Jews who will finally recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But it will true tribulation. You know, in World War II, we have 6 million Jews who died in the Holocaust. That's one out of every three Jews died in the Holocaust. You know, these seven years, what Zechariah said, during this tribulation of seven years, Zechariah said, in the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. That means during these seven years, two out of every three Jews will die. Friends, this is the worst holocaust that they will encounter, that they will have to experience. But during this time, they will recognize, indeed, we missed it. Jesus, indeed, is the Messiah. And so, friends, Jesus Christ said, I have to cut short those seven years because if I don't cut it short, nobody will survive because two-thirds will die. Only one-third will be left. If I, if I extend it more than seven years, nobody will survive. And so this is where we find Revelation 6 to 18 because it talks about those seven years. What will happen? Why is it that Jesus Christ said, I have to cut it short? Because during those uh, seven years, this is where we have the seven years of tribulation. Revelation chapter 6 to chapter 18. For example, the first uh, judgments is the seven seals, chapter 6, verse 1 to chapter 8, verse 5. So you have there the seven seals, uh, and then the fourth seal alone, one-fourth of mankind dies. If during this time there were there are 8 billion people in the world during that time, let's just say, I'm, I'm just assuming here, if there are 8 billion, one-fourth will die, that means 2 billion will die, only 6 billion will be left. We're just on the fourth seal. And not only that, after the seven seals, of course, these are all the, the plagues that are happening. Right now, we have COVID-19. Friends, this is just a dress rehearsal because the actual plague in Revelation 6, one fourth, two billion will die. But then after that, we have the seven trumpets. And here in the seven trumpets, look at this. On the sixth trumpet, look at that. One third of mankind will be killed. One third. Remember, out of the eight billion, two billion already died. Or we have now six billion left. And then one third, that means another two billion will die. Half the population already will be dead by the sixth trumpet alone. And we still have the, the seven uh, bold judgments. And so right there, the seven bold judgments, starting in chapter 15, verse 1, up to chapter 18, verse 24, seven bold judgments. Look at that. On the, on the seventh bold judgment, look at that. Worldwide earthquake, cities collapse, 120 pound hailstones fall from the sky. Wow. Cities will collapse. An earthquake, California will just slide to the Pacific Ocean, or maybe New York will just slide to the Atlantic Ocean because of these massive earthquakes. And look at the 120 pound hailstones. What's the punishment for idolatry? Stoning to death. This is the ultimate stoning, 120 pound hailstones. And that's why Jesus Christ said, I have to cut it short up to seven years only because if I don't do that, Jesus Christ said here, for then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days have not been cut short, no one would survive. 
But for the sake of the elect, that's the Jews. Remember, two-thirds of them will die. For the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Matthew 24. And so friends, when Jesus Christ comes back to shorten it so that there will, the elect will still be there, Jesus Christ comes back and this time he's going to establish the kingdom of David. Finally, angel Gabriel, who gave this promise to the Virgin Mary, you know, during the uh, announcement that she will conceive, the angel Gabriel said, He will be great, referring to Jesus, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And that's the start of the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Every time you pray, Our Father, how our heart in heaven, thy kingdom come. They will be done. We're talking about the millennial kingdom. And so Jesus Christ comes back here, will reign for 1,000 years. And after that, I saw a new heaven and new earth, and the first heaven, the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. That would be God's eternal plan. That will be for eternity. So friends, where are we in God's prophetic plan? Well, we're right there. 2020 is right there. We're still here in the church age because the church is not yet complete, but until the full number of the Gentiles come in. Once that's full, friends, what we're doing right now is we're contributing to the millennial kingdom. Every time you share the gospel, we are contributing subjects who will welcome the sovereign, the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ said when he ascended to heaven, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Go disciples of all nations. That's the word church. Church means ecclesia. Is the word ecclesia. It means the called out ones. There are called out ones from every tribe, every country, every language group, every people group. There are those people who are part of this number of the Gentiles. They need to come, come in. So friends, what we have here, not only we are to verify and fortify and purify and occupy, we are to multiply. That's our MO. That's our mission order. Go therefore make disciples of all nations. You know, I've always wondered what, G what the Apostle Paul meant by these words. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He's saying, I am debtor to the Gentiles. Why, why, why was he indebted to them? I've often wondered what that means, indebted to them. And then I heard this explanation. Let's say I'm going to ask you to get this $100, this is Canadian $100, and I'm going to ask you, kindly give this to Pastor Joe, okay? Pastor Joe Alpapara, kindly give this $100, all right? I'm going to give this to you, and then you're going to take it and, and give it to Pastor Joe. That's what I, I ask you to do. Now, friends, as long as you're holding on to this $100, and you have not given it yet to Pastor Joe, you owe him $100. You are indebted to Pastor Joe, $100, as long as you're holding on to it. Friends, the treasure of the gospel has been entrusted to us, and God said, give this to them. Give the gospel to them. Friends, the reason we are indebted to the Gentiles, you are indebted to your office mate who doesn't know the Lord. You are indebted to your neighbor. You are indebted to your cousin. You are indebted to your friends. Everyone who doesn't know the Lord, who hasn't heard the gospel, God has entrusted to you the treasure, and God said, Give it to them. As long as you're holding on to that gospel and you're not speaking out, you're not telling them. Friends, you owe them. You are indebted to them. And that's why, friends, that's where we are right now. We are here and we are to evangelize. This is the best time to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ when people are so aware of their mortality. Despite the economic progress that we have, despite the 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 advancements that we have, technologically advanced, scientific advancements. Friends, we are frail, we are helpless, and we are hopeless apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus Christ said, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things, all these things, what you will wear, what you will eat, where you will live, all the basic necessities of life, Jesus Christ will take care of that. But seek first His kingdom, and his righteousness. Brothers and sisters, this is where we are in God's prophetic plan. And there is a call for each one of us. We need to respond and say to him, Here am I, Lord. 
Use me. Use me during this time. Brothers and sisters, I hope this is a challenge to each one of us. Let me just pray right now. Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit will continue to convict us of our complacency, of our compromises. And Lord, we pray that we will be committed to the task that you've entrusted to us to share your word, to bring out the gospel. Because unless we do, Lord, we are indebted to these people that you have given us in our circle of, of influence. And so, Lord, may this challenge continue to ring in the minds and hearts of your people. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless everyone.
City Church is now available online. Follow City Church PH on Facebook, Instagram, and Spotify for the latest news, playlists, and recordings. Oh, and a lot more. For live and recorded preaching, subscribe to City Church PH on YouTube. You may also log on to www.citychurch.ph for more information. See you online.